Uh, first, welcome everybody. Thank you so much. And I am just honestly blown away that I am about to uh, have a conversation with Michael Horn. I, I, I have to tell you, I am so appreciative of you doing this and I can't even believe you said yes. So uh, from the get go, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, How are you, Beth? Uh, a thrill to me on, on multiple levels. And so as we begin, um, what I'd love to do is introduce you, Michael, and forgive me, I'm going to just read directly from your bio. So as I look down, I'm just, I'm cheating. Um, and I'll look, I'll, I'll, I'll look down in uh, a, sh a shame of whatever's going to be <laughs> read, go, but go yeah. for it. Uh, so uh, again, my host is, uh, my, my guest is Michael Horn. Michael is the co-founder uh, uh, of the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation. He's also an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He co-hosts the top education podcast, Future You and Class Disrupted. He is a regular contributor to Forbes.com, New York Sun, uh, the Substack newsletter, and he writes for the, I'm sorry, he writes for the uh, Substack newsletter, The Future of Education. He also serves as the executive executive director of Education Next, and his work has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, Harvard Business Review, and many others. Um, he's the author of several bo books, including the award-winning Disrupting Class, How Disruptive Innovation Will Change the Way the World Learns, Blended, Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools, Choosing College, and most recently, and I just read this, and I'm so excited to talk about this, um, uh, just last year published from reopen to reinvent, recreating school for every child. So again, so excited uh, to have this conversation. Um, and, and Michael, as you know, through our exchange, it's a, a series that I've been doing, um, really talking to folks about AI, what that might mean uh, for education, specifically looking at dyslexia and LD education, but very open to wherever this conversation takes us um, and just really eager to, to hear your thoughts. Um, before we kind of dive into our, our topic uh, at hand, one of the things that I love to do with these conversations is, is start with a, a question about um, your own relationship to school, right? So you're, you're somebody that's dedicated your life to school, um, which again, we'll get more into, but I'd love to know what was school like for you? What, what, what what's your relationship uh, and memories of school? Yeah, it's a good question because I'm, it's sort of, I think, funny for someone who is so actively and vociferously trying to overturn conventional school structures. I, I really liked school. It worked for me. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, elementary school in particular. I will say middle school was r fairly miserable uh, and uh uh, high school, I really enjoyed. Um, it was a great participatory experience. And I think a lot of my, uh, shall we say, challenges as, a, in, as an adult uh, around certain mindsets and things of that nature, frankly, stem from school of my sense that like, hey, do the minimum work just to get the A, right? Or do, do you know, do, sort of uh, uh, approaches, uh, fears of failure, things of that nature that that I fought in myself very actively. But when I think about like, where do they come from? I think a lot of it was sort of ingrained in how school was done and how I played the game really actively. I was really good at playing the game of school. Yeah. I remember getting to college and being like, finally, I don't have to play that anymore. And and uh, having a very different experience. And then being shocked to learn that when you apply to grad school, it turns out that they have expected you to still play the game of school. And so that was a challenge for law schools, uh, which, you know, in the end, it worked out that I didn't go to law school. But uh, it, it's just, in, I think that's how I'd sum it up. Yeah. So, and out of curiosity, growing up uh, and, and playing that game of school, were you an independent school, public school, both? What was, what was that track for you? I, I was public school my entire uh, life. I went to uh, Walt Whitman High School uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and through that uh, feeder set of feeder schools in the district of Montgomery County. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that that was my experience. My my parents never, I think, thought otherwise, uh, okay. and are sort of stunned that my own daughters are in a uh, independent independent Montessori school uh, yeah. near where we live. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I am a public school guy too. My whole entire life, I never knew there was, you know, anything else. Um, I, in fact, I remember my parents they divorced, and there's a brief moment where I went uh, uh, and looked at St. George's Independent School in Memphis, Tennessee, where I was growing up. Um, anyway, I knew nothing about independent school, and I, you know, you go through and there's this process, and they interview and did that, and I just thought they like were recruiting me. I just thought like these people had found me because I'd never experienced anything like it. Um, but so it's funny. So I went through all public uh, and then ended up uh, in a career in independent schools, um, specific LD. And I, and I will say one of the things uh, kind of on that track that I, I appreciate about your work so much is that it is it's herald uh, in, in uh, independent schools. You know, I've, I've seen you at many independent school conferences speak all those things. But you also are just, 
so committed to public school reform. And often those are two very different conversations, right? There's independent school that can be a little bit easier. It, you know, there's more autonomy, so on and so forth. So as, as we get into this too, I also just want to say, I appreciate that very much. No, that, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's been a, it's been an education for me, you know, when NAIS tapped me to be on its board, gosh, that was probably 2014, 15, something like that. When I started serving, uh, John Chubb was still alive. He was the head. It was an education. Like I learned a ton and I have continued to learn a ton and it's been, it's been really rewarding. I mean, it's, it's the independent school world is a fascinating place with really smart, dedicated educators and leaders uh, that, that I think I've been enriched by. So, so I've really enjoyed getting to know that community. And as you say, uh, public schools, helping them innovate has been a major focus from, from day one. Yeah. Which is, which is incredible. Um, incredible. Um, all right, good. So as we get into things, um, another question I love to ask is, as you know, we're going to have this conversation, it'll take us a number of places, but somewhat centered around AI and what's coming and what this might mean for education. How do you define AI? So as we have this conversation, you know, what, what, in your mind, what is, the, what is the box you're putting around it? That is a great question. You know, um, and uh, Brent Jacobson of the, um, of the uh, Mount Vernon School, of course, they've done some terrific thinking, I think, about like, not just defining AI, but also the different branches of AI in a way that's sort of understandable. But, you know, broadly speaking, my simplistic way uh, of thinking about it is AI, it, you know, seeks to use uh, uh, computer algorithms, right, to uh, affect uh, the Turing, to, to, to you know, uh, solve the Turing game, if you will, or the, the, the Turing test, right, which is to say that it approximates how a human uh, would answer questions and be able to fool uh, another human being into saying, I think there's a human on the other side of that box, in effect, right? And so uh, that's how I think about it broadly. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's much deeper than that when you think about deep learning, deeper um, uh, machine learning and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, and, and there's different strands of it with generative AI versus uh, AI in particular fields and things of that nature. But but broadly speaking, that's how I think about it. Um, and I would say the other piece of that, though, that's, I think, implicit in the definition is that the algorithm itself is constantly updating and learning from its own past experiences, not necessarily to improve, right? But it's not static. It, it, it's one that expands just as our own minds do in good and bad ways. Sure, sure, yeah. And I think that expansion piece, right, is is part of what makes it so fascinating, right? And and, and potentially so consequential. Um, I have to tell you too, uh, so Brett Jacobson at Mount Vernon is one of my very good friends, uh, but the fact that you just referenced him, I will never live down for the rest of my life. Uh, so uh, I just, you know, for the record, I, I am disgusted that- I uh, apologize, I apologize for that, but uh, yeah. but everyone check out, everyone check out their writing on this because I, I thought it was the most cogent definition in sort of a very like constrained way and then branching out the two- uh, the two sort of major developments, if you will, uh, in in AI or two major schools, if you will, of AI. It was super helpful for me. Good, good. Um, so, again, so many things I want to I want to get into. Um, first, though, so I, again, uh, I just recently read uh, uh, your most recent book. Um, absolutely loved it. And I, as I was reading it, one of the things that I kept thinking about is it was. Uh, and, and for folks who haven't read it yet, and, and please obviously uh, correct me, uh, but it, it is essentially a call to arms that coming out of COVID, we not we need to stop thinking about this as recovery and more as an opportunity to revolutionize or to not try to um, uh, return to a system that didn't work in the first place, right? Is that, is that a fair summary? That's 100%. That's 100% right. Yep, that's 100%. Um, well, one of the things I love is that throughout it, you, you profile, I think it's Julian Jeremy, uh, is that right? Right. So, um, uh, and, and kind of profiling somebody from uh, uh, more of a disadvantaged background and how school does not necessarily work for them. And then uh, 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 Julie, who comes from a more privileged background and yet still school still doesn't work for them. But as I was reading it from my vantage point as an LD school leader, as a dyslexic person myself, as a parent of two dyslexic kids, it was just a playbook for what I think parents of LD kids go through and experience and this idea of a system that we put so much faith in that that has so many tools and so many resources and yet perpetually fails to meet that over and over again and so anyway i just thought that was so interesting and i i didn't know if 
if as you wrote that or if in your own experience, have you ever uh, kind of looked at that intersection of, of LD and schools and that, you know, mismatch? Yeah. So I love that you said that because I'll give you a few data points. Number one, um, the, the big thing I wanted people to take away from it is regardless of like where you come as a family or student into this landscape, I wanted people to say like, oh, wow, like school doesn't work for anyone. And in some ways, like certain populations or the media, right, has said, oh, yeah, we know that it doesn't work for these kids, but it's working for everyone else. And I was like, no, I want everyone to walk away being like settling for mediocrity at best is not OK. And so that that's that's number one. And so just did two characters because I've been told that's sort of what you do at a book. Right. Uh, but but um, and, and frankly, like I left out a lot of details about those characters because I wanted people to fill in the blanks with whatever like they whatever their assumptions and 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 backgrounds and diverse perspectives were i wanted to create the canvas blank enough that they could fill in those uh blanks if you will with with the things that matter to them so i love that you took it there number 1 number 2 i've always felt and this goes back to disrupting class like when you look at places what what we call areas of non consumption right where the alternative is nothing at all and that's really where you can launch these really breakthrough innovations that the special needs, quote unquote, community, LD, et cetera, like those are prime areas for us to do things differently and create a much more robust uh, learning world, I'll say, instead of schooling world, right? And so so that that's number two. And then the da third data point I'll say is my, my co-author on Choosing College, uh, Bob Mesta, um, uh, and and he's the founder of the jobs to be done theory that I use a lot in from reopen to reinvent. He developed that with Clayton Christensen and has done an enormous amount of work in it. And I'm writing a new book with him right now, actually, as well. He's just become a, a mentor, friend, collaborator. He is highly dyslexic. Even today, he can barely read. Wow. Um, and so school, his mom was a public school teacher and she sort of taught him how to hack school and get by. But school did not work for him. And he, he's literally missing a chunk of, of his brain in the front. Um, and I see all the superpowers that it gives him because he reframes so many problems uh, and opportunities in really different ways. And I'm like, wow, right? And, and I see that superpower he has and how he has learned to lean into his strengths and have a very asset-minded view of himself and, and sort of you know, mitigate the weaknesses, if you will, right? D you know, do enough to, to to get by, but say like, hey, that's not me. It's okay. This is who I am. Um, I've just gained such an appreciation through him, I guess, would be ab ab about how he sees the world, how school made him feel. And, and it's fascinating. Like I've had him, he's done a lot of work for NAIS, National Association of Independent Schools and some other independent schools over the years, because I've sort of dragged him into this education world. He gets so nervous in front of school heads. And I'm mm. like, you, my friend, are like the smartest person in the room by far, right? Like you've cre helped create literally over 3,500 products and services and everything from, you know, s space and, and defense to cars and healthcare and like, you know, billions of dollars worth of services and, 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 and goods and products. Um, He gets so nervous because of like this sort of, reminder of what school was to him and he'll and he'll be like and he'll just start putting himself down and and you could see like he, and and we're all like stop like you are great you are great as you are and so i guess to me seeing that impact I, I, you know it's something that it's a frame that i really have learned to hold and think about um in a visceral way that i don't know that i would have come to the work that way you know 15 years ago yeah um, first of all, it's fascinating. I, I, I had no idea of that, that connection. Um, and I, I, I always love to hear uh, so that I can then share, right, th these brilliant people who are dyslexic, right, and, and whose brilliance often stems from the fact that they're dyslexic, not despite the fact that they're dyslexic, right? So I think yes. that's an important message to hear. Um, and I think that, you know, and again, we'll get to AI, but I think that is at times explicit and implicit in your book, too, that the, the failure to personalize, the failure to create these pathways for kids, and, and your own experience, right, you were good at playing the game, 
failure at that or being poor at the game or not even being able to you know access you know even the the rules of the game could be traumatic right you got this grown man who gets in front of school heads right and feels like he's in the principal's office again um, yes exactly he has any it has visible ptsd from it i would say yes like i like so for me i i still have to like even when i was reading your bio just now uh, I, 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 and I know the, you know, Clayton Christensen, I knew that name, you know, you know, for decades now, but I had to practice 15 times before we started. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure I still stumbled because reading out loud for me goes back to fourth grade and the round Robin and everyone having to, you know, sit there and read uh, the paragraph out loud where no one's paying attention, you know, it was just absolutely traumatic. So, um, th that certainly resonates. And but just, but just, but, but just stay on that for a moment. Right. Because like, it's insane if you talk about like personalization has become my big thing. You know, the goal, right, is to get you to be able to read and digest content and do something with the content or whatever else, right? Like that sort of comprehension is the goal there, right? And you don't need to read aloud <laughs> to, to get there. You do need to be an active learner. Like that's a really important part of it. And that's a consistent principle, I would say, but how the modality through which you do it, whether it's in a small group, whether it's with a, I mean, now thanks to AI, it's with like, you're, you're reading it into a computer. It doesn't care if you messed up the first time, it's going to let you do 50 reps at something, right? Until you get it. I, that personalization that's possible. And it drives me nuts when I see school models that have so many things about the science of learning correct and get such great outcomes for disadvantaged kids or whatever else. And they're like, well, the only way to, you know, digest a passage is now to have the whole class, like read aloud and do the round robin thing. And you're like, I know that's not working for a percentage of your students. And yeah, there's some confidence building at parts in there, but like, let's be very specific about what's the learning objective and the best way to help build toward that. And if there's a performance, public performance thing we want, you know, kids to master, let's scaffold an experience around that. And that is not the round robin of reading. Right, right, right. Uh, it, but it, it's, uh, you know, so much of it, I think, also comes back to um, our own nostalgia for how we think school was supposed to be. So we're going to perpetuate what was never worked in the first place and probably didn't work for any of us to begin with. But, you know, we kind of convince ourselves that. Uh, and I, I like how you uh, kind of isolate the public performance part of that too, right? Because that's that's your point. It's not comprehension that we're actually testing. We're layering on this uh, uh, this other skill of performance, right? And uh, what does that have anything to do with what we're actually trying to teach or understand? Um, and so it's interesting too. When I, when I was reading your book, so what it was published a year about approximately a year. It's, ago. I think it's almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. And so so much of it in in, in my mind has been uh, accelerated or potentially accelerated because of AI, right? So much of what you you talk about, like, oh, well, you know, to your point just now, AI could give you 50 reps of that. When you were writing it, was that, I'm sure it was on your radar to a degree, but was it influen as influential as maybe it would be now just because of where we are? I suspect I'd write something pretty different uh, based on now. It's interesting. I was super skeptical and dismissive of most of the AI stuff that I saw in education before ChatGPT. And uh, there are exceptions, um, you know, like Amira Learning has used AI to uh, do some great work with reading instruction to our point here, right? Or Soapbox Laboratories to use AI to understand children's voices, for example, because, you know, all the algorithms from Amazon, Alexa, and so forth are trained on adults uh, and not, not kids. Uh, and the frequency and pitch and sort of uh, effects that kids have or are not always well understood by those things. Um, I see that all the time with my kids still. But so I was like bullish about AI in very specific applications or AI to help teachers with like administrative tasks, right? Take things off their uh, uh, plate. But I was super skeptical of AI as a more generalized answer to how we personalize, frankly, because like we don't have a really good map of like how different learning concepts connect with each other outside of maybe math and, you know, learning how to read. Um, and so as a result, like, you know, these algorithms are only as good as the data on which they're trained. And if we have bad data or bad theories, or, you know, we're not using really good learning science, you're going to get some pretty bad, useless tools. And, and so that was my big fear about them is like, people thought we could just throw them out to the wild and they'd somehow say, you know, 
you know, Michael, like today you need to learn X thing because like, you know, predictive power, I'm super skeptical of that now. So what's changed in my mind, I don't think the AI is any better at doing that stuff, <laughs> but I think it's really good now at interacting with you and coaching you and building like models off. We do what we do know to ask and prompt questions and test understanding of comprehension and things of that nature. It's now like really good at that stuff. Right. And so it, it, it plays a very, I would say different role, if you will, uh, uh, from what I had imagined the Holy grail that we were trying to attempt might be. And I was so skeptical of it, it now has a very different role. So I, I think the book as a result, um, I, I don't know that I would have changed a bunch of it. Cause like, I'm really talking about the model, right. Of learning that we, that we assume and like, what's the change management process there. And I still believe kind of that like AI can turbocharge that model redesign, but I'm not sure it's going to overcome the limitations of a bad faulty model. Uh, but, but it, clearly like my mind has been stretched and blown by the developments since November. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's what blows my mind is it's since November, right? It's not like over the last three years, you know, it's since November. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, what could that possibly even mean? Um, so to, to that point, too, I want to kind of, cause again, I, as reading it now, I was making all these connections and I would love for you, if you don't mind for a moment, talk a little bit about your kind of advocacy for changing school from a zero sum game to a positive sum. Right? And again, because I think AI could have a, a, a role in that, but could you kind of explain that framework shift for a moment? Yeah, hundred percent. And I agree with you that AI could have a role in it, but I'll just say like schooling as it's laid out is premised on a zero sum a, a game. And the assumption is basically like, I win, I get the A, you lose Josh, like you, you, you know, you get the B or C, right? We grade on a curve. We, uh, even if in places where we don't grade on a curve, teachers, when they write recommendations are asked, like, is this student, was this person a top 1%, 5%, 15%, 50%, right, for college applications? So much of the game is of school is sort of premised on this. There are a certain number of winners. They get to go into the advanced classes. They get to go in the gifted and talented programs. All the fights, frankly, around magnet schools and exam schools that we see in the public system, those are all fights around scarcity mindset, right? Which is all zero sum game. And so this sorting mindset has created this zero sum world. And my observation in, in the book is, is one from Todd Rose, which is that this is at odds with how life is lived outside of school, which is to say most parts of society, we could say like NBA basketball perhaps is like a notable exception, but most part of, of society are built on a positive sum uh, frame of the world, which is to say it's an abundance mindset. Like you doing well has spillover effects that benefit me and me doing well, like has spillover effects that benefit you. And our goal in life is to specialize and find like where we can uh, make a contribution in the world. And me being successful doesn't undercut your ability to be successful, right? Like capitalism, so much maligned uh, in, in so many places right now, is actually built on this idea of like us trading and cooperating and exchanging goods through dollars. And by the way, we don't even know each other, but like we can have these, you know, games of trust that are perpetuated and, and grow the pie for all of us when it's done well, are all built on this positive sum mindset. And so it moves the, 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 the question of schooling away from like, can I beat you on this one narrow metric, right? Of test scores and grades to, can I use schooling to figure out like who I am as a unique individual in the world and how I can best contribute to that world, right? And in that world, we all have a way to win. And all of a sudden schooling becomes this, you know, set of experiences to help you discover your purpose and passions and, and build these things right in your, in your life and craft them and learn them in a very different access. And so that, that, that's sort of the, you know, it moves us away from the game of schooling toward, Hey, this is about building your capacity to be prepared for the world in which you're going to uh, continue to exist uh, as an adult and continue to be learning. Yeah. So I, I love that so much because it, it, it kind of gave language to something that I think, again, LD kids, LD parents feel all the time, right? We're losing this game, right? It's very clear. But I, I think most people don't fully appreciate 
until you have that language, that's what school is, right? You, you, you talk about how school's purpose right now or under traditional structure is to sort, right? But like we need to figure out, and I, I think most of us would not articulate it in that way, but when you say it and you think about the systems and the way we measure and what we value, that's 100% what it is, right? It's, it's sorting people. For what reason, I'm not even sure, other than to try to suggest who's the best and maybe who's the worst. But Yeah, but that's 100%, right? And it's built out of this industrial mindset, which was to say, and you can even go back to Thomas Jefferson's writing on the purpose of school, which is, he said, it's to sort the upper crust, essentially, to say that they're going to go to university and they're going to be our political leaders in, in the in the polity and the society, right? Uh, we're going to have some set that are going to be effectively the managers. He didn't use that word because he didn't have that sense, right? And then you're going to have like the laborers, the farmers, the we would say industrial workers, right, in the industrial age and so forth, that frankly, like they just need to learn how to read in the Bible and sort of American values. And like, that's great. Like, go, go, go forth, right? But it's literally the system that we have built is designed to sort people into those different tracks. Some set will graduate, some set will go to uh, college. And I, I would argue like a lot of the ed reforms that we've been doing over the years has been to try to like blow up that system, but without explicitly acknowledging that that's the system. And so that the results we get of dropouts, only some set of students mastering knowledge, only some set of students being able to do college level work, et cetera, et cetera, is actually like a feature of the current system, not a bug. And so if we hate it and we identify it as a bug, my basic thing is like, let's redesign the system so that we are not trying to sort people, but we're trying to develop each and every person. Yeah. So it, to that point in the, in the book, you, you highlight, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it. So forgive me. Uh, but essentially that in school time is a constant and the actual learning is the variable, right? Um, yep. And that's something that we've never really challenged. I mean, to your, whatever the ed reform, it still has to happen within a 10 month period. It still has to happen that, you know, on Tuesday, we're doing X and by Wednesday, we're doing Y come hell or high water. Um, and I thought that was, again, it, when we articulate it that way, I don't think anyone would agree we should promote time over the learning, but that's exactly what we do over and over. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. And you think about an LD child, you know, like some set of kids come into school, they already know their phonemes, they already know their, right? They already know a bunch of things. Let them go nuts, like let them go reading, right? And, and start to write papers and develop those interdependent sets of skills and build their background knowledge and so forth. Great, like they don't have to spend time on the phonemes and, and, and identifying sound to, to uh, letters and so forth, right? Some kids, they come in, like they don't have that basic understanding. Why would we accelerate you past where you need to be working? Well, I, look, I don't want you to neglect the background knowledge. I'm going to use audio and video and so forth to build that, right? Keep building that. But like you, it should be personalized for your level and you should move on from those mastery of phonemes or whatever it is, right? Once you've shown mastery of it, it's insane to accelerate you past it because of all the things that's going to haunt you later in life. Right. And we could probably have a conversation. You might say, well, Michael, like, you know, that social studies unit that you're doing, like, I don't really care if like every child masters it. I, I more want exposure there. Okay, like, that's fine. We can have that conversation. And we can say, what are the power standards or core competencies that we really want mastery of? Like, we can have that conversation, but we should have that conversation and be explicit about it. And, you know, I, I love to say like, you know, NAEP, right? People bemoan that two thirds of students are not proficient in math in fourth grade or whatever it's, you know, precise number. And you might say, well, that's just a test. That means like two thirds of kids do not know is two eighths bigger or less than one half. Right. Th that, that's crazy. Like they should master that before we ask them to do algebraic fractions in seventh grade. Like that's something that they should master and the time should be variable on it. And we shouldn't be sitting there using that as a sorting point to say like, oh, Michael, you're never going to get to learn X math or master it because you're never going to have this skill. Like, that's crazy. Uh, but that's what the current system does. And instead, it, it you know, the current system sets up this rat race to try to run faster and harder and to get into, the, you know, the, be sorted up, if you will, uh, as opposed to, hey, like, maybe, Michael, you just need a little bit more time on X concept. And by the way, once you really get it, Maybe you're going to accelerate through math, or maybe you're going to go super deep in a science concept 
because now it's like super interesting to you. And we should allow you to do that. Like we should allow you to accelerate, move fast or move deep. Like that, that should be, again, a feature of a system, not something that like, oh, you know, your fourth grade teacher happened to have the bandwidth to pull three kids out and let them do an enrichment report. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you feel like to me, and I, I'm going to get back to the teacher thing in a moment, because you discussed that as well, which I think is fascinating, but this idea of, of having more flexibility with time or not letting time be the driver, to me, that's an area where AI can make a fundamental change. Do, do you agree with that? Do you, do you see that? 100% agree with that, right? Because like we've all of a sudden given capacity to every child to effectively have a tutor alongside them, right? And so, you know, this is why like the big gold standard of learning has always been tutoring, right? There's a lot of research around that. You don't have to believe the two sigma. You can still see that there's tremendous impact from tutoring done well. But like we have a fundamental problem as we just proved in the race over the last few years to get tutors to every single student, which is like, Human capital is scarce. It's really hard. And yet like Conmigo, right? That's like sitting there alongside the kid, not judging them, giving them the reps that they need. I, that's a really cool force multiplier that we can now design around that kernel to build some pretty robust learning models that I think fundamentally overthrow, you know, as you said, the dominance of time, the curriculum that you have to get through on certain days, the 180 days are in Massachusetts, I think it's 990 instructional hours, right? For public schools and private schools actually, right? Like that's the requirement. I, that's not what I wanna know about. I want, I, I want to know the mastery of, of learning. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And, you know, on that point, you know, there's, there's this opportunity potentially to really disrupt that, right? Disrupt the way things are. And in your book, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like part of what you talk about and your motivation in writing it was we have this opportunity post COVID and we're somewhat squandering this opportunity because we're just kind of perpetuating. We, we have all these resources. We've done a great job kind of uh, circling the wagons, but we are, we're doing that really just to perpetuate something that continues to not work. Do you fear that we could, that and you've somewhat already referenced this, but AI could be the exact same thing. We, we could just digitize or, you know, take these algorithms to perpetuate something that doesn't work in the first place. That's my huge fear. Uh, and I will say that's why I like I if I'm being totally honest, I didn't think I was going to write another book in K-12 education after the set of books I wrote about blended learning. I like I thought I had said what I had to say. Right. And then COVID happened and I felt like, holy smokes, like this is an opportunity and that so many parents and educators are saying, don't go back to normal. They've seen what it is. And they're asking big questions and they want new opportunities to rethink things that they've held sacred in the past. Let's not mess this up, right? And I'm really super worried that a lot of places are. Um, we could talk about bright spots versus down spots later, perhaps, but I think AI is much the same. Like we could, if if the result of this is we just digitize the current curriculum and structures I don't, I mean, maybe there's marginal benefits and I shouldn't poo-poo it, um, but I won't be that excited about it, right? And and to me, this is true in all things. We wrote about this in Disrupting Class, like the phenomenon of what we called cramming, which is when you layer new technologies into an existing system, it perpetuates all of the processes and priorities of that existing system. And so one of our reads of why so much of education technology had not had a transformational impact, uh, you know, had had done what Larry Cuban famously observed, right? It was that it had effectively just crammed the technology into the processes and routines and, and teaching structures that had already existed. And again, maybe there's some marginal benefits, right? But it had not fundamentally transformed it because it had just taken them as givens as opposed to rethought them. And to have real impact, I think you have to really build new models around the technology. The technology, to be clear, it's an enabler, right, of new learning models. It's really powerful in that way, but the model is far more important in my perspective than is the learning itself. It's, it's one of the reasons, like, I look at Montessori education, that is fundamentally, at, at least for math and, and, and learning to read, that is fundamentally a time variable learning mastery model. 
and it's one and, and they build it around technology. It's not digital, it's the manipulatives, but it's built around the technology of the time, right? So how would you take the new technologies coming out and build new models that do that even better and more and make it more widespread and, and on and on? Like those are the sorts of questions that I think we ought to be asking. It's why I get so excited about uh, my friend Joel Rose. He has he started with um, School of One. It's now called Teach to One out of new classrooms. Like that's a new way to do middle school math. That's a learning model. Or now he works with uh, Transcend to have the model exchange, right? Different models of learning. Or, or we talk about like what Brad is doing at Mount Vernon, right? They create new models of how to do entrepreneurial learning in high school, right? We, we ought to be taking these new models, but using technology as we develop them to see like, what can we build that, that can scale worldwide and like really help kids in different circumstances? And it, it's not that there's going to be one model that does it all. I think that's a faulty premise, but that we can build lots of different models uh, are, are, are around what's available. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and again, in reading your book, you gave language to something that I was trying to, to understand. And you talked about with the pandemic and this huge disruption, and you know, we were all panicking, myself included, that uh, we, we essentially, in we saw it as a threat, and in seeing it as a threat, we mobilized, but we, we innately, uh, subconsciously, just mobilized about protecting what exists. Like we're, we're just, we, we gotta make sure that we are able to do exactly what we did in a radically different way, but it's still exactly what we did, right? This, I thought that was fat, this kind of human response to say, in, the, in facing something that is threatening to us, we're, we're going to see it, we're, we're, we're gonna perpetuate. It, 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 am I capturing that correctly? I, you, you seem to have read the book better than I read it. It wrote it is what I would say. So, but I think that's right. Like, and there's a huge amount of research. It turns out that that's a very natural human and indeed species instinct is to see a threat and sort of go into this, it's called threat rigidity, but this cower sort of like, okay, arms up. And, and like the good, the good thing about naming something as a threat or being threatened by it is it focuses your attention it focuses resources on something. So I don't want to say like, you know, us being upset about learning loss or whatever else, like there's a positive to that, right? Like all the money from the federal government would not have flowed into the education system were it not for us having this panicked response. But if you leave it in that threat framing, that's where the real injury occurs. You need to task a separate autonomous group with the opportunity to say like, okay, what would we go build it, like to see this threat as instead an opportunity, like with all our know-how and all of our ethics and our understanding of kids and whatever else, right? To build something cool and novel and different to help those students make progress. And th that's what I think we have not done so much is instead we said, to your point, like, hey, fifth grade teacher that's teaching in the classroom, like now do it in Zoom. And like, isn't technology great, but do it the exact same way, right? And so, and, you know, that's why Zoom teaching sort of sucked is that we replicated a model that wasn't working terribly well in the physical world and had all these terrible, I would argue, downstream effects, and then just put it in the virtual world. And like, no wonder so many students disengaged and were unmotivated and felt unseen and embarrassed to turn on their cameras, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And now we have a whole bunch of like even worse downstream effects, I would argue, uh, in the mental health and so forth of kids from this experiment. And, and I'm not mindful, like I'm mindful that social media and other things have created a lot of these conditions, but I sincerely believe that if schools look different, we could actually combat a lot of this, but because we have the structures that we do, it's just not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. And and I, I get frustrated when people say, well, we, we tried, you know, look, online learning didn't work. It's just, you know, absolutely ridiculous um, to, to think of it uh, uh, in that way. And and I, I loved in the book when you talked about how we need to turn this, our framework, into thinking of it as an opportunity. Threat can mobilize, but then how do you think about it as an opportunity? And, and one of the things that I find that I, again, the, the book gave me some language, when I talk to educators about AI and you know what this could mean, so much of the first initial response is, well, we're going to go back to the blue book. Damn it, we're just going to go back. 
And it's just like, I think you're missing the bigger picture here, right? Um, but I worry about that. I do worry that we are going to, uh, as an educational system, have that, that threat rigidity. I think you said, right? Uh, I like that, right? We're going to double down on that while the workforce changes. And I, I'm afraid that we're gonna see an even broader uh, 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 separation between what we're doing in schools and then what is gonna be expected in the workforce. Cause we're gonna keep demanding the blue book in schools and what we expect the, the, the efficiencies and the productivity that come in, in kind of career are just gonna be a huge mismatch. Does, does that make sense I'm to terrified. you? I'm terrified. Yeah, 100% I'm terrified by this, right? Because I think, again, if, part of the purpose of schools is to prepare students for what they're going to do when they're not in formal schools, teaching them how to use AI responsibly, teaching them to understand the limitations of AI, the biases of AI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is like a really important function and developing the parts of the human being that are not commoditized by AI, right? So you, you know, I think what's there's a lot of anxiety right now on the part of students that like, hey, what jobs are even going to be there in the future, given AI and automation and so forth. And my read of the world is that actually the complementary skill sets of humans with AI is going to be the most powerful thing out there. But what does that mean? Well, it means that like clarity of thought and fact checking and knowledge and how I ask a prompt and writing are actually going to be very important, but how I do that might change, right? Um, do I write my way? Do, are papers still relevant to like, maybe not as a performance task, but maybe as a way to understand a problem? Yes, maybe they still are. Is rhetoric, is speaking really important now? I think it's hugely so because that's a place where human beings are going to be really uh, valued in community. That, that's my suspicion, right? And so leaning into that. Is philosophy and ethics and history going to be really important? I think so, because like, the, you know, history may not uh, uh, echo, but it rhymes, right? And so I think uh, to be able to call out like dangerous strands and understand demagogues of the past and slippery slopes, or to be able to think about really tricky ethical questions. Like if you, if you end up being someone that is designing these systems, or is using these systems to do work and thinking about, you know, autonomous driving vehicles in the future or whatever it is, right? Like there's going to be some really tricky situations that we're going to have to think about. And so having schools lean into that, I, I think is going to be incredibly important. Now, here's the really exciting thing on all that, which is that in my mind, we've sort of over-indexed over the last 20 years into the STEM fields at the expense of the humanities. This is going to be an opportunity, I think, to course correct that because I think the humanities are going to be incredibly valued and valuable uh, in the future. And, you know, because like we're going to be able to use the AI to do the coding, but like we're going to have to ask the right questions and be thinking about the right ethics and like, hey, maybe I need to bring in people with different perspectives on this thing so I don't have a blind spot and build an algorithm or build a tool that um, does a whole bunch of unintended things that I never thought about, right? That That is awful. Um, those are going to be skill sets that I think we're going to want to develop in fruitful, smart ways in the future. Uh, and, and frankly, just to tie it back to, you know, your world, the LD population and so forth, like how important is that to have people who learn differently at the table as you're building these things and value those perspectives? Like when I build a product or service, I would have zero faith in my ability to do it without someone like Bob Mesta at the table, you know, pushing me and asking questions and, and arguing with me and so forth. Like that's a whole skill set that I want kids to learn to embrace. And, and it's one of the reasons in the book, as you know, I lay out my thoughts on the core purpose of schooling. And the sixth one is to understand that people will have different ways of seeing and thinking about things. And we shouldn't persecute them for that. We should actually embrace and treasure it as a way to make us all better. Yeah, no, so much of that I, I love and, and, and resonates uh, on so many levels. Because I, I think in the book too, that last point, you talk a lot about the pathways, right? Helping kids create pathways for what come next. And I remember in school as a kid, 
part of the reason I went to education is because I felt kind of vocational. And I felt like that was really one of the only things, you know, an, as an option to me, right? Because the whole sorting and, you know, I couldn't be a lawyer. I couldn't be, a, I couldn't do these other things. I had to kind of pursue a, a vocation, right? And so um, I, I love that. And I also love what you said. And I found this fascinating. I hadn't really thought about how AI might actually augment or bring back the humanities, right? Because I think right now the scare, the fear is that it's going to do the opposite, right? My, uh, you know, writing is going to go away, reading, you know, literature. But I think it's such a great point that, you know, uh, I mean, in, even now with, with you know, Chatbot's new uh, plug in the, the code, whatever it is, that we all have a data analyst at our side, essentially, right? That's mind blowing. That is mind blowing. Yeah. Um, so I love that point that, you know, it might actually free us and require us to be able to think differently, to think deeply, to really think about not the technical aspects as much as kind of that, the philosophical human pieces of that. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, I think, you know, like something I've been really wrestling with um, is what's the role of knowledge, right? In, in, in all this and, and learning around knowledge and so forth. And my own take is like, um, I think it's going to still be really important as the foundation. And and for a long time, you know, there've been people out there that say like, knowledge is not sufficient. We need to learn how to think critically with it and communicate, et cetera, et cetera, like the skills people. And I, I say yes to all of that. And my worry in that conversation has always been that some people will say, well, knowledge is not important because Google is here. And I'm even hearing that even more now with AI, like knowledge is not important, except that we know AI messes up knowledge all the freaking time. And so being able to learn how to fact check it, and it's not that I need to have mastered every single trivia thing, or like I heard a lot of people during the pandemic and the racial reckoning and, and, and awakening be like, I can't believe I never learned X in school. I'm not sure school's job is to teach you every single laundry list of facts, but I think you want broad sweeps of understanding of history. You want broad sweeps of understanding about the scientific method and what we currently, you know, the best thinking on science right now. You want broad sweeps of understanding around arts and music and 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 so forth, so that when something comes up, you know how to inquire about it. You know you, you can like do the smell test, right? Like it's it's the thing we ask students to do all the time when you're doing a math problem which is you read a word problem and you're like, okay, finger to the wind, like, can that estimate, does that even make sense right on its face before you even go deeply into solving the problem, right? Like, oh, you realize uh, the implications of such and such statement or, or like the dot-com boom and bust, right? The implications of the valuations of those companies were that uh, the, the companies being created then were like 7X, the world's GDP at the time. So like you knew it couldn't be right, right? Like not all those companies were good, right? Just like little things like that, that you're like, oh, I, I should go deeper on this and push the AI to like really figure out where truth is, or I want to do my own research on this, right? Um, I want it to link to sources and then I want to be able to validate, you know, do, do I think that's a good or bad source to be able to make such a claim or assertion, right? Things, things like that, I think are incredibly uh, important. And so my sense is like some automaticity is still probably important. One, some background knowledge of sweeps of history, probably not trivia, if you will, are still really important. And yes, then it's like, what do we do with that to help create and help uh, push? And and my own take, one, one more thing on this, my own take is like the AI is going to make our capacity as individuals to create things so much more powerful. And like, that's going to be really exciting. And I think it's going to get a lot of educators really excited because they didn't want it to be about just learning the facts and regurgitating. They want it to be around creating, right? Meaningful artifacts and so forth. I, I like, I think it's going to be so cool what students are going to be able to create in the future and helping them do that even better and channeling that toward productive ends to your point, that's in lockstep with what like the world of work and our societies need. What a cool opportunity, but you know, it, it's going to mean that we have to question a little bit, like what does the curriculum look like? So th the reaction to run away from AI, I, I think is really, really unfortunate as opposed to like, okay, how do we use it? What does it allow us to do? What are the new things we want to do? What do we want to stop doing uh, as, as we embark on this?
And yeah, and what, what do we need to, what do we want to stop doing? That's a huge question. We never think about in schools, right? We, we only think about what more do we need to do, never what uh, do we need to stop doing. And to that point too, and I'm being mindful of time, we only have about eight minutes left, uh, but in that kind of fear of AI and running away from it, in the book, you also talk about the need to think about teaching as kind of a, a team exercise, right? And I, I think, and again, in reading the book and kind of, you know, in today's context, I think about AI being a part of that team for a teacher, right? And so not only are we going to be able to create new opportunities for our kids, I, I think we're going to be able to give tools to our teachers. We're going to give the hopefully be able to give them time back. Because um, you talk a lot about teacher burnout and how that was kind of, uh, you really even preceded uh, uh, COVID, right? It was ex 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 exasperated. But would you agree with that? I mean, like this idea that I don't have to be a third grade teacher who's excellent at everything because now I have this little sidekick by my side. Yeah, I think that's right, right? I mean, and, and as you said, like my big push is for more co-teaching or team teaching to distribute expertise. And I think AI turbocharges that, right? Like I, you know, it's going to be way easier, by the way, to create content for kids to learn in more robust ways, more in line with the science of learning around the importance of active learning in the future than sort of dry static video or dry static whole class instruction. So that's great. As a teacher, I don't have to do nearly as much content delivery or lesson planning. When I do lesson planning, there's an AI bot next to me to like help me accelerate it, right? When I'm trying to figure out you know, Michael's really struggling with this concept and like the three ways that it was explained to him in, in the digital curriculum he was doing and then like with the peer tutor. And then when I did some small group instruction, like none of it really landed. AI is going to be able to help me with that, right? AI is going to be able to help uh, with keeping track of kids' progress. AI is going to be able to help with analyzing data maybe to like understand where kids need certain help. And I don't need to be a master Jedi of all those things anymore. Isn't that awesome, right? Like AI maybe will help me even make sense of um, all the different uh, family structures and things like that kid influences that kids are having and like even make sense maybe of like, gee, Michael is learning, you know, music outside of school. And so like, he doesn't want to do music here. Okay, that's fine. Like that's not where our, you know, I, by the way, I'm a big believer in, common spaces and common activities for building culture, but like maybe it's not music for every kid, right? In, 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 in a given school, that's fine. Like I, I, I think it, it's going to allow us as teachers to really like do more, get to know our students better, engage more and take things off of our plate. And frankly, if it doesn't, if a tool doesn't do that, it ain't worth your salt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're so right about all those things. And I think it's going to be interesting because I, I think we might find the individuals that become attracted to the field of teaching or the skill sets that really we're looking for are going to evolve and change a little bit because they're right now, the model is more, I'm the expert and I, and I'm, I have a great deal of control and that's how this is going to work versus somebody who is, uh, potentially more empathetic, right? Or more of truly that that guide on the side um, that we've talked about for years now, but haven't been able to really implement on a full scale for a variety of reasons. But I think part of it is time and resources and all those things. So I think that's tremendous. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree completely. I'll, I'll say, by the way, for those tuning in, I've answered a bunch of thing questions in the Q&A also about how to keep up with AI and some things like that. So hopefully that's, that's helpful to folks uh, if, if they're following along. Well, I'm watching you do that, and I I can barely read the questions. And the fact that you are able to to read and answer, I I'm astounded. So thank you for doing that. Um, so we're we're getting close uh, to the uh, close uh, of time. Kind of two questions. Um, one, I, I I've heard you speak on this topic before, and uh, I think it was even Ed Week, and it was kind of posed to you about you know what do you think AI is going to do to education? And I think you correctly said we have no clue, we have no idea, right? Um, but with that said, do you what is your, what is the level of urgency that you think as schools we need to bring to this? Like in terms of a timeline of, uh, again, we just talked about, you know, from November to now, the changes, what, what, what is your thought on, on how, how soon we need to tackle this, think about this, you know? Yeah, I, I would love to see educators having thoughtful conversations around what does this mean for the future of curriculum? What do we want kids to all wrestle with and learn? I would love, and I think that's imperative 
soon. Um, uh, because I think we're going to have to, like the implications of that are going to have big ripple effects and take a while, right. To, to deal with. So that to me is a big conversation. I have given some ideas today with you, but like smarter people who are actually in the classroom should, should tackle this. I think a second one is the tools are being developed right now. And I would think you would want educators coupled with those tools to make sure that they're useful <laughs> and helpful to allowing them and students to make progress. And then the third one I would say is, I, I don't think it's fair to ask people who are in the middle of teaching, right, their current class to be developing new models. But I think schools ought to be empowering sets of educators and saying like, hey, you go off to the side here and build a new model around X. Or like, let's take this model that someone else developed and try it because we think it's really cool and we're going to contribute to making it better, right? Because again, I think the model of learning is more important than the technology and the technology can really enable some exciting new models. And I would love to see independent groups of educators within schools, with new schools, whatever it is, right? Like, you know, with, with in an individual classroom, whatever it is, like building new stuff around this that stretches parents' minds, society's minds, educators' minds around what's possible. Because ultimately, I think the way we change school is you build a groundswell, not a top down, a groundswell of like families that all of a sudden are like, oh, I don't have to accept zero sum schooling. I never knew that was a problem. But because now I'm in this positive sum world, I can see there's a cool way to do it. And I'm going to tell three other parents about it as well. Yeah. Um, to that point uh, that you, you just made and you make it in the book, I think it, for a school leader, it really resonated with me. This idea, but we we can't expect teachers to continue to do exactly what they're doing while also reinventing what they're doing, you know, simultaneously, right? Yeah. And yeah. We, good luck. Yeah. And, but at schools, we're terrible at that, right? We we're terrible. Keep doing what you're doing, but then I also, you know, in your free time or during that, you know, 45 minute planning period, I need to do X, Y, and Z, and that that really got me thinking about how do we create these autonomous groups that have the opportunity, the freedom, the resources to actually think and change and play and model. Um, and, and it, it makes sense in business, like in business, you're not going to create a new product by assigning it to the people that are perpetuating, you know, the other ones. Yeah, so it's I crazy, right? You would never ask the Toyota engineers to build, uh, the, the Prius And frankly, uh, you, you know, you would never ask GM to build Tesla, right? Like he, he, you get different groups of people to do it for a school. And I'll, I'll end with this thought, like, I, cause I, I think this can be daunting for school leaders. This is a great use of philanthropy. Right. Like this is a great place to fundraise to articulate, like, we're going to build a new schooling model or a new classroom model for X, or we're going to try to build a better way to teach social studies or whatever it is. Right. Like, this is a great use of philanthropy so that you have free cash flow and humans <laughs> to work on a problem. I, I, I think that's such a great point, too, uh, because, you know, we, we tend to think of philanthropy as buildings, right? What, what building are we going to build, right? You know, what, you know, so I, 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 I very much appreciate that. And I, and I hope there's some philanthropists listening because uh, that would be convenient uh, uh, for sure. Um, all right, so as we come to a close, first, there's some, some back and forth in the chat about a link. Um, we'll, when we send this out, we'll make sure that we have uh, uh, the correct link uh, and, and, and anything that uh, Michael has resourced, we'll include in there too. So uh, don't worry if, you, if you've missed something or you want to go back to a resource, we'll make sure we try to highlight it when we send this out. And with that said, on resources, uh, Michael, I'd be interested, um, three things, three things that you, uh, uh, we, we recommend that we either listen to, we read, we watch, whatever, and it could be on any, any topic that we kind of delve in today, but are there, are there three things you would leave us with or recommend that we, we dive into? Yeah, to keep an eye on. Um, I, I mean, I look, uh, there's a, a couple folks. Um, I should have provided a link to this, but um, uh, Lawrence Hunt and Jacob um, uh, Klein, um, who, um, as I'm saying that, I probably have the name wrong, but um, sorry, Lawrence Holt, I always say his name wrong, but um, who've created a great medium page where they are literally tracking new tools, new AI tools in different parts of education. So it's a great like map that you could keep, keep, keep abreast of, right? I think the second thing I would say is keep an eye on the, the, the learning model exchange that transcend education is maintaining because 
the idea of that is you can just actually borrow some of this R and D and like figure out how to use it. And then the third one, I would say, there's a lot of new uh, programs in the public sphere around education savings accounts and micro schools and things of that nature. I think that's going to be a really interesting R and D laboratory. And a lot of those, from my observation, have created really cool new learning models, but maybe not business models that can sustain. Which is a great place for an independent school to say like oh, that's a cool idea. I want to go do that. And I know how to build the business out of it, right? So that it's sustainable. Uh, and so I, I think there's some really cool things there that can be done. I, I uh, That last point especially really resonates. I, I uh, very much appreciate that, right? Yeah, there are some cool models out there, but that's what they are right now is models. And yeah. Yeah, okay. they're, not, they're, they're not sustainable schools yet and yeah. for the most part. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, such a great point. Um, well, Michael Horn, we are we are right at an hour. I cannot thank you enough. This was absolutely fascinating, um, so exciting. Uh, uh, I hope that you know a year from now we can do this again because it'll just be so exciting to think about what the let's do it world looks like uh, uh, from 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 then. So again, can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was amazing, um, and uh, yeah, we'll just keep this conversation going. And I can't wait to see what we what we learn next. Sounds like a plan. We'll do it next time in person in Beverly. How about that? That's right. Perfect. Perfect. All right. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody that uh, is tuning in um, and uh, have a great day.